Excellent uh, presentation, Paul, and I uh, fully endorse the, uh, the school's project. Uh, I can remember back to when I was 8, 9, 10, 11 years old, I was obsessed by Lego, Meccano, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, but if I'd had a 3D printer, I think I would have gone delirious. Absolutely. And they are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. On the 4th of May, 1904, Charles Stuart Rolls, a well-connected, marketing-savvy aristocrat, met Frederick Henry Royce, a miller's son and brilliant engineer, and they met in the Midland Hotel in Manchester, my hometown. Now, this historic meeting resulted in a partnership that would become world famous for engineering perfection and top-end luxury, Rolls-Royce. Now, even today, even today, anywhere in the English-speaking world, even today, anywhere in the English-speaking world, when someone has done a particularly good job, uh, you'll still hear them say, have done a Rolls-Royce job. So our final speaker, who's made it just in the nick of time, Sorry. Japanese manufacturing style, <laughs> our final speaker in this session is Dr. Hamid Mughal, who's got, in my opinion, one of the best jobs in the engineering world, Director of Manufacturing at Rolls-Royce PLC. Now, I think you know there are two Rolls-Royces, Rolls-Royce PLC, which focuses on air engines and defence, and Rolls-Royce motor cars, owned by BMW. So let's give a very warm welcome to Dr. Hamid Magal, one of the UK's finest engineers, and hear his thoughts on the challenges and opportunities of 3D printed technology. Dr. Magal. That is very kind. Thank you very much. My sincere apologies for uh, just arriving in time. It wasn't just in time, it was slightly late. Uh, left south of Birmingham, half six in the morning, for a meeting in London, half eight, and I got here quarter to 11. Um, one day, hopefully, we'll be able to reprint ourselves in different locations across the globe, <laughs> so we don't have to suffer M40 and, and A40 as such yet. Anyway, um, we heard some fantastic presentations, uh, very enthusiastic, and range of products, imagination and products. I'll talk about aerospace and aerospace engines although we have two divisions, very, very large divisions in our company, Aero and MIPS, uh, Marine and Industrial Power Systems. My reference to this technology today, and we don't have too much time, I'm trying to summarize it in two or three or four slides, I think, will be based about the Aero, Aero world. I think it's, it's easier to understand. And within that Aero world, specifically the powertrain aspects of that, okay? Now, let me just take you a step back and just explain to you. Additive layer manufacturing, as I prefer to call it, rather than 3D printing, yeah, is, is part of a suite of advanced manufacturing processes called powder manufacturing processes within that. Some of you would know metal injection molding, yeah. Now, huge opportunity for us in the aerospace, of, you know, world, particularly because of high temperature alloys, is you know anybody dealing with mnemonics, how difficult it is to forge those. But what MIBS have done for us in the aerospace environment is to create very, very complex, close to size finished components, particularly in the high temperature alloys, seven Inco 713s and things like these. That's the one aspect. The second key point is that in a forging process, you know, you probably have five versions of the process to complete a component. In MIMS, you have the injection and then you have the post processes, basically, yeah, just two. So great opportunity for us. Then you move on to the powder hipping processes, nut shape powder hipping. Up to 75%, you know, savings in materials, particularly for those large <coughs> components they used to make from, or we used to make, and we still make some of them, from forging. Now, great opportunity, fantastic process, because the hot temperature and the pressure creates the kind of dense material properties commensurate with forging and close to size finish. Instead of spending hundreds of hours in machining and subtracting components, you actually build up. We still have huge cost challenges, though, particularly in the canister tooling. How do we create cost-effective reusable canister tooling. So these two great technologies already adding great value to the aerospace sector. What additive layer manufacturing does is combines these wonderful characteristics into one technology. Yeah. 
two ways I see that. Blonde powder, there are lots of different mechanisms, additive layer manufacturing, but blonde powder, where you blow powder into a path of a laser beam and melt, or powder bed, you know. Uh, powder is raked into layers and then melted using EB or laser. Uh, uh, beams as such. So just these two different versions. There are other iterations of these as well. But what it does, what this technology does is it changes the way we think about manufacturing. A different mindset basically. Yeah, Complex components, very difficult components that you can start creating in a slightly different way. It's iterative in the sense design make iterations. Things that used to take months, you can iterate design make in weeks. You can make prototypes faster. You can iterate that to design process. Almost close to finished components, you can do those. It also creates customized components, processes, and, sorry, and assemblies as such. Things no other process could do, you could create them. Gives you extra design freedom in the aerospace environment. So fantastic opportunities. However, however, it is challenging. To create a quality assured, aerospace component, particularly in the area I'm talking about, which is the power units, don't forget the engines we make for the aeroplanes operate plus and minus 50 degrees centigrade, that kind of a range. Plus 50 degrees centigrade, minus 16, that kind of environment. Parts of that engine operate at 1600 degrees, which is 200 degrees higher temperature than the core alloy from which that component is made from. I'm talking about the HP turbine blades. <coughs> Each one of those HP turbine blades generates a takeoff power equivalent to a Formula One car. And there are 66 of them around just one disc. Okay. At the centrifugal force at 12,000 RPM of that disc, you can hang a double-decker bus. That's the kind of centrifugal force of 18 tons and generated. We're talking about different products with different requirements, with different operating conditions. And therefore, we have to put this wonderful technology into that context. The point I'm trying to make, there's a lot of hard work involved in getting there. Okay? So all the benefits you've spoken about, the iterations, the design loops, the freedom of design, and the manufacture, which will be fixture-less manufacture. Wouldn't the world be a wonderful place when you don't need fixtures? directly because we're in a digital world we create exceptional absolutely exceptional digital models in the virtual environment in very 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 good master model environment we create them we simulate them we prove them we we we, we do all the process modeling on them and we know they work and then we go through a long long sequence of design process through pre-production production tooling Proving machine tools, complex CNC programs, CMM programs, you name it, it's done. Now, if you look at all that value chain, ultimately the customer pays for it, adds cost throughout that value chain. If you can, from the master model, digitally download all the features of the master model and the individual components and can print them, that's a different world. That's a game-changing world. But are we there yet? We will be there in the future, but we're not there yet. Okay. So the challenges, I had to put this up, going to make sure that we balance our enthusiasm for this technology, which is very, very justified. The days when you could download a toy for your kid from the next generation of internet, all the way down, and then you can send it to your local DOI or your own garage and print it to the shape and, and condition you want to, it's not that far away. That will happen. But the products I'm talking about, there's a lot of hard work still to be done. Okay. Equipment. Machines are not fast enough at the moment. Yeah. And they cost because they're slow. It takes a very long time to make some of these components and therefore they're not cost effective. And by the way, if you have EBM machines, 10, 15 of them in one room, making components, how do they interfere with each other? What happens? We're talking about electromagnetic world here. What's the correlation between two machines on one side and ten on the other side? What issues we may or may not get? What's the interference between these? How do you lay these things out? Then you look at the powder. What's the condition of the powder? How do you actually validate the powder? Where do you get it from? What is good powder 
for aluminium, for example, and what's a good powder for a nickel alloy? And how often do you use it? And when do you stop using it? And how do you ascertain its condition after 10 uses or 10 components in recycling? Then properties. I'll put a list here you can read yourself. Properties. How do you validate the properties? How do you inspect these components? How do you make sure there are no porous parts that's, you know, two or three inches deep that will cause or become nucleation points for porosity or, the, or cracking going forward? There are some fundamental challenges that we have to overcome, and therefore it requires a scientific, deep scientific approach, methodical approach, learning the science of additive layer manufacturing, understanding and then applying it methodically and building our knowledge base, making sure we do that as we go through. So when we do make these components and products, they are the highest integrity, they are foolproof, and they're positively right for that particular product and that service. Another point where I just want to highlight, most of engineers like me, we brought up on mechanical engineering, thinking about subtractive processes. That's all we do, because machining is natural to us. Everything else, like forging, forming, is natural to us. We've been brought up on these things. Therefore, the design rules we've created in engineering are fundamentally based on current processes. How are we going to create the design rules for aerospace components or complex automotive components in the additive layer environment? They have to be rewritten. We have to think differently, just like composites. Metallic engineers thinking about composites doesn't, don't quite do justice to it. So therefore, people working in mechanical engineering environment thinking subtractive processes, they have to think differently. They have to open their minds and think about the design rules in the PLM environment, feature by feature design rules. So learning, knowledge, depth comes into it. And supply chain, absolutely vital. Do we have a powder supply chain robust enough if we suddenly get everything right and we start making everything from powder? Who are the big players? Where do they exist? How do we get the cost down? We don't have that supply chain at the moment. It's going to take a while. What are we doing? Exactly what I just said. We're working on huge enablers, and these enablers understanding the materials and the property databases and creating those databases, integrating additive layer manufacturing models into the PLM, PLM, product life cycle management, which is the master model environment, the engineering database and, and, and the detail definition, the geometry of the components and the processes. We're integrating the ALM, additive layer manufacturing knowledge into those. What's the cost? Once you make, once you print, once you create a part, what's the post-process after that? If that ends up being very costly, then it may not be economically viable to do these things for a long time. Fast make, using it for fast make, which we do, we make lots of jig components, we are developing products using additive layer manufacturing, we do a lot of the repair techniques using additive manufacturing, so we are active in it. We make hundreds and hundreds of these things. But all the time, we're learning, we're creating knowledge and feeding knowledge into our engineering systems. Yeah. Huge amount of work in characterizing powder, I mentioned that, and process modeling it. This to a point where the chemistry and the physics is understood. Okay. Demonstrated in production, design visualization of the components. We do quite a lot of that, and we've been doing it for years at the moment. Yeah. Production cells of blown powder repair method. I've got next slide which explain that in a second. And large scale Y feed. We, we did that 10 years ago. So elements of additive layer manufacturing we've been working on for almost 10 years. But our approach is very methodical. We respect the environment and the industry that we serve. High integrity products that last 30, 35 odd years operate in very extreme conditions. And therefore, what we want to do is build up our knowledge base before we have this wonderful explosion of components and products that go into our products eventually. An example I do want to give, which is a really very, very good example of a successful application of additive layer manufacturing. Blisks are the front end of compressors uh, in the engines. I mean, you're talking by the air, just below the fan. If you think about a Trent engine, sucks in air at about one ton a second, almost like a squash cord gets sucked in every second. And that gets compressed in the compressor section where the blisks are 40 times you compress it, yeah? So we call it blisks because these are aerofoils 
very complex set of foils blended onto the rim, either made from solid, which is your machine from solid, or linear friction welded into it, seamless joints, adaptively finished. So because they are the front end of the engine, foreign object damage, takeoffs, landing and all that, you can get erosion occasionally and you could get slight damage. So do you throw all that away? That's very, very, very expensive. Thousands and thousands of pounds, okay? No. So you use the latest technologies like additive layer, blown powder technology, where you blow powder and you use in a laser path and then you melt it and you fuse it. So what we do is we, we clear up the area which is damaged, we then, we then scallop it all out, and in inert in atmosphere, we slowly build it layer by layer by layer. Yeah, some of these layers are 50 microns, yeah, 25 to 50 microns. And then we adaptively machine using the most advanced machining techniques to totally blend it and get it to the finished both properties and the condition that the equipment <coughs> and product requires. Now this is as advanced manufacturing process as you will get anywhere in the industry. Because these particular aerofoils, if you think about a human hair, I've forgotten how many microns thickness it is. It's about 75 microns, 70 microns thick a human hair. These aerofoils, some of the tolerances on these are plus and minus 8 microns. That's the level of accuracy we're looking at. And yes, we use additive layer manufacturing, blown powder method to repay those. So we're taking the most advanced of these methods, using it on our products, but our enthusiasm is measured and balanced by how far this technology has to go to create products, the one that we supply to our customers that last 30, 40 odd years and take us safely from point A to point B, you know, many thousands of miles away. Okay? So hopefully, I've given you a very quick perspective of the aerospace environment where I come from. Uh, Game-changing technology, yes. Revolutionary technology, yes. But if we are to maximize its potential, we have to work very, very hard at it and learn it before somebody else does and takes a lead on us. Okay. Thank you.